There we go. So I would like to introduce everyone um, who may or may um, have familiarity with Sarah Forrester, but Sarah Forrester is Assistant uh, Attorney General that is our attorney for uh, Child Development Services. And she will be presenting today on, a, on the Freedom of Access Act, FOA, for us. And we're gonna be recording this for future reference. And I think she might have a couple other topics that she is going to also respond on after, maybe. I'm not sure. We did talk about a couple of things. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Forrester. Thank you again for taking time out of your schedule to do this for us. Sure, sure. Not a problem at all. So for those of you who were here in August, which feels like basically a million years ago, I have no idea what happened to September and October, except for some vague essence of pumpkin everything. We talked in August about FERPA and what is FERPA and what are the parents' rights under FERPA and what happens with people who are not parents who are interested in information protected by FERPA. I guess one thing you could say about today's talk is that it's sort of a follow-up to that because the other document-related topic that CDS sometimes gets involved in is Compliance with Maine's Freedom of Access Act, or FOA. FOA essentially is there for the purpose of open government, for transparency, and even though I'm beginning to feel like this is an endangered word, for democracy. Because in a democracy, or at least a functional one, people need to know what their government is doing so they can decide what they like and what they don't like and vote accordingly. There are two components of FOA. The first has to do with public records, and the second has to do with public proceedings. So let's start with public records, because that's the one that by far, far, far is more significant to CDS. And yes, this really is the statutory definition of a public record. Any written, printed, or graphic material, or any mechanical or electronic data compilation from which information can be obtained directly or after translation into a form susceptible of visual or oral comprehension, that is in the possession or custody of an agency or public official of this state and has been received or prepared for use in connection with the transaction of public or governmental business or contains information relating to the transaction of public or governmental business. Everybody that thinks a lawyer must have written that, do raise your hand because yes, this, this is a very lawyerly paragraph. But what does it really mean? How do we reduce this to some key points? Well, first of all, it includes more than paper records. Specifically, it includes electronic records and electronic data compilations. A second important point, it pertains to records that actually exist. In other words, FOA is not about creating records. It's about identifying what exists. Third, they need to be in the possession or custody of a government official or government agency. And finally, it has to be a record that's related to the transaction of public or governmental business. I like to say that that explains why my grocery list, which is written on the back of a meeting agenda and was being done while I was sitting there trying to ponder whether or not I was actually in the wrong meeting, is not a public record. There are exceptions to what is a public record. Here's the big one. Records that have been designated confidential by statute. Another one that we sometimes see are records that would be within the scope of a privilege against discovery or use as evidence. That's an exception that protects communications mostly between you all and me. And an exception is personal contact information concerning public employees. So designated confidential by statute. What are some good CDS related examples? Well, first of all, FERPA, 
FERPA, FERPA, FERPA, FERPA, right? We spent a whole hour in August talking about how FERPA is very strictly monitored and those records are confidential. And so FERPA is our number one confidential by statute. Certification record, certification records are confidential. And personnel records, state personnel records are confidential by statute. Actually, according to the state website, there are more than 300 state statutes that make certain records confidential. Can you imagine how excited the intern was that got that assignment? Search the statutes of Maine and find the confidentiality statutes. Eesh. Sometimes there are records that are some parts of which are public, but they contain confidential information. That means that the agency is obligated to redact, which is a lawyer word for blackout, confidential information contained in an otherwise public record when the agency or the official determines that it can be done in a manner such that public access to the record can be provided. Some statutes though, or situations make the entire record confidential. That often happens with education records because no matter how much blacking out you do, the point is the entire record is unique to one particular student. What are the public's rights with respect to public records? Well, the statute says they're entitled to inspect and copy them. During the regular business hours of the agency or the public official having custody of the record, within a reasonable time after making the request. Now the agency can charge some fees related to public records requests. First of all, the agency can charge a reasonable fee to cover the cost of copying. Second, an agency can charge a fee to cover the actual cost of searching for, retrieving, and compiling the records of not more than $25 an hour after the two hours of staff time, the first two hours per request. And that also includes reviewing and redacting confidential information. If a translation is necessary, the agency or official can charge a fee to cover the actual cost of translation and inspection, translation, copying, it may all be scheduled to occur at such time as it will not delay or inconvenience the regular activities of the agency. So I want to stop here and be very clear about what it is we just reviewed. A parent asking for their child's education record is not treated like a FOA request. In other words, you do not charge a parent for getting a copy of their child's education record, nor can you wait and produce an education record in a manner that's convenient or consistent with the ordinary course of business for the agency. As you know, parents of children with disabilities are entitled to get the records that they're seeking prior to the IEP team or IFSP team meeting at which they're going to be discussed. So you cannot sit on any sort of records request from a parent, and in general, they should all be wrapped up within 45 days of a request. That's different than a FOA request. So back to FOA. There is no legal requirement that a FOA request be in writing. An agency can certainly ask a requester that they put the request be in writing. And the reason that you do this is because that way you have a clear record of when the request was made and received and what were the records that were requested. So my bottom line for you is, if the requester will not put it in writing, you put it in writing. In other words, you document the day you got the request and what was requested and if the requester has given you the right contact information, you should go ahead and send the requester an email saying, thank you for speaking with me about your FOA request. 
my understanding is that you're looking for X. If this is incorrect, please contact us back. In other words, you're closing the loop so that everyone's clear about what has been requested. What happens next? Okay, another pause here. In CDS, the way that you have chosen to handle FOA requests is to have them handled centrally by the state office folks. So what does that mean? That means if any of you out at the sites receive a FOA request, and again, that's a person other than a student's parent or guardian asking for records about their own student, you need to get it to the central office as soon as possible. And this is why. The central office is gonna to need to respond to the FOA request with a five-day letter. What's a five-day letter contain? First, it's an acknowledgement of the request. Second of all, it's an opportunity for the agency to ask for clarification of the request. Also, you need to inform the requester if the request is denied or is expected to be denied in whole or in part. And what we generally do is we raise issues like FERPA, if that's applicable, like personnel records or certification records, if that's applicable, and tell the requester that we won't be able to specifically know what we can produce versus what's going to be denied until we see the actual documents. Within a reasonable period of time, the agency has to give a good faith estimate of when records will be produced and of costs, if any. So now you have to actually produce the records. To be clear, the records do not have to be produced within five working days. I would say about half of the FOA requests that I see that mostly come from the Department of Education, the requester will announce, this is a FOA request and I'm entitled to have the records within five working days. Actually, no. What you're entitled to have within five working days is a five-day letter. The records need to be produced within a reasonable period of time after the request was made. What is reasonable? Well, okay, classic lawyer answer. It depends. It depends on the scope of the request. It depends if the records are in many different locations or in one location. It depends if the records are gonna to need to be redacted to remove confidential information. All of those things can make what's a reasonable period of time. So for a long time, we had a debate about making the records available. In other words, telling requesters, okay, they're here at the fifth floor, come see them, versus mailing them to the requester. Generally speaking, we do not ask people to come in and review them for a couple of reasons. Okay, the first and obvious one are all the COVID protocols that we've put in place over the past few years. But the second one is, generally speaking, it's easier to simply scan the documents in and send them electronically than have people traipsing around the fifth floor, finding a conference room, and telling them to put post-it notes on anything that they want a copy of. I mean, to be clear, that's compliance with the law, but on the balance of inconvenient for staff versus any incidental benefit, I don't know that they might not tag every single document that's responsive. Now, generally speaking, we just send them out. All right, some common misunderstandings about FOA. This is the biggest one. FOA is not a record retention statute. In other words, you are not violating FOA if you don't have a record that the requester thinks you should have. Not a FOA issue. The agency has no obligation to create records or summaries of records to satisfy a request. 
In other words, the requester can't say, I don't want all 500 pages of that. Just tell me the following things. Nope, that's not how it works. However, sometimes the agency chooses to provide a summary because the agency thinks that that is either more helpful to the agency or limits information that might be able to be used for purposes that the agency might not want it to be used for. The agency can choose to create a record or a summary like that, but that is not required under FOA. And if the agency does choose to do that, if the person or requester comes back and says, no, actually, I think now I'd like all of them, they still get all of them. The agency has no obligation to answer questions under FOA. So sometimes we get FOA requests, and then as soon as it's been sent out, we get an email back saying, I don't understand the following things and wanting to start a dialogue about the records. That's not FOA. You have no legal obligation to engage in any of that. I will note that that does make the requester very unhappy because at this point, armed with the information they received, now they really wanna to talk to someone about it. And being told that that's actually not their right under FOA is never a favorite. Finally, there is no such thing as a standing FOA request. So for example, a request for every memo that CDS gets, every legal memo that CDS gets from the Department of Education about their obligations under IDEA. No, in other words, FOA is at a point in time. It's what do you have at the time of the request, not whether you might get something that's in the same category or similar to what's being requested after the request. Okay, that's the end of public records. Public proceeding is actually something that barely touches CDS at all because, and here we say this in all caps, IEP or IFSP team meetings not public proceedings. Why? Because you're going to be discussing information that's confidential under FOA. It wouldn't make any sense to make all of the students' education records confidential and then say that any meeting to discuss them has to be public. A public proceeding is the transaction of any function affecting any or all citizens of the state by boards, commissions, agencies, and authorities. Essentially, when CDS used to be governed by local boards at the sites, those boards were covered by FOA and those board meetings were public proceedings. But now that CDS is within the leadership group of the Department of Education, there is no board similar to the former governing boards to be covered. However, sometimes there might be an advisory organization or a task force. Those are generally thought to be covered unless the law, resolve, or executive order creating it specifically exempts the organization from the application of the subchapter. So for example, the CDS task forces from last year were public because they fell into this piece of public proceeding, that it was an advisory organization, a task force, that idea. Public proceedings require notice if the body or agency consists of three or more persons. It requires that they be open to the public. The public is able to record either audio or video the proceeding. There is no requirement that the public be allowed to either speak or participate in any way. Also, as long as it complies with statute, there can now be either partially or fully remote public proceedings. That's something that is a lingering 
takeaway from the COVID era. Before COVID, you could not have remote public proceedings. And as a result, we had folks in Maine traveling great, great, great distances to get to public meetings. That is not necessarily any longer because there are ways that organizations can, working within the statute, have either a partially or fully remote public proceeding. For proceedings for which notice is, requir is required, a record gets made within a reasonable period of time that itself is open to public inspection. In other words, you can have it under FOA. The record includes the date, time, and place of the meeting, the members of the body recorded as being either present or absent, and all motions and votes taken by individual if there is a roll call vote. Executive sessions. Bodies that are subject to public proceeding requirements can also go into executive session. It can't be used to defeat the purpose of FOA, and it's limited to the discussion of specific types of matters defined by statute. You go into executive session by a motion to enter executive session, and that motion must identify the statutory basis for the executive session. Even if deliberation is allowed in executive session, all final acts or approvals of the body must take place in public. So what are the consequences if you defy FOA? Well, requesters can appeal the denial of access to records to court, decisions made by a body that should have been made in a public proceeding but were not can be voided, and if it's found that you engage in a willful violation of FOA, there can be a monetary penalty accessed. Anyway, that is the very long story of FOA for CDS. And I guess what I will do now is ask whether folks have any questions about FOA or how it might apply to you. So I thought I would just um, back back you up on um, the uh, submission of FOA requests to the state office. And the reason why the uh, request to come to the state office is for that five-day letter. I send all FOA requests to the commissioner's office. Then they respond to the um, applicant who's asking for the documents with the five-day letter, and then I work with them and the site based on the FOA request and, and the documents. So please, please, please make sure that they, the FOA requests do come to, to, to me so that I can um, make sure that we follow the protocol that Sarah outlined in her PowerPoint. Other people with FOA thoughts and questions? Oh. To what extent do you document FOA requests? Emails in the special education file or just in the communication log of SYNC, et cetera. So let's start with the fact that a FOA request should not be for an individual student's education records. Remember, people who are asking parents, legal guardians, DHHS caseworkers, remember that when a child is in the care or custody of DHHS, that caseworker is entitled to receive education records. Those get documented in the special education file, but they are not treated as FOA requests. I'm trying to think of a circumstance in which a FOA request would be documented in an education record, in an education file as an education record, and one really isn't coming to mind. I don't know whether, Roberta, you can think of any recent requests or maybe if you could tell the team. Uh, uh, so one that comes to, yeah, so one that comes to mind, Sarah, is when we had a, an audit, uh, we had a, a due process case mm -hmm. and um, the due process case um, became public and was posted. And then we had a request from various news people and uh, audiences for the uh, information on that due process case. Okay. 
So that's a good example that sometimes things that happen um, get picked up in a bigger sort of mainstream interest. Now, do processes are generally considered to be not public unless with respect to a due process hearing, the parent asks that the hearing be open. That's their right. The other thing you have to remember is that while CDS is very careful to keep student information confidential, parents do not have to keep student information confidential. They are free to share anything about their child with anybody that they want. When we get questions or requests for information as a result of that, we're still bound by the same rules. In other words, a parent can't quote unquote, open the door for CDS to start releasing education records because they started by releasing some of their child's education records. One of the things that can be the most frustrating, okay, probably not the most frustrating, y'all probably have a very long list, about being in public education is that parents can make allegations, they can give some but not all of the education records to people, and you can't comment. In other words, even if the answer is that in no way, shape, or form is what happened, let me tell you, eh, huge buzzer, you cannot respond. We always say, Student information, education records is confidential by law. We cannot respond. Other questions? Gosh, y'all are quiet for Monday morning. Maybe it's because it is Monday morning, Sarah. Well, that's possible. And I'm only two coffees in, which is about two coffees short, but. <laughs> we'll see. I think I made it through the presentation without sounding too sleep deprived. Yep. I, I appreciate your your uh, insight and, and update on, on FOA for us because I know that we are required to do a FOA uh, training every year before the start of school. So this, like I said ah. earlier, this, this will be... Um, this is recorded and will be updated and loaded into ADP so that you can access this recording. Um, and <clears throat> given that it's only really about 30 minutes long, that should be an easy review for you um, from year to year. But it's, it is important for us to understand how to um, respond to various requests and what is um, a record that is accessible and, and what is um, confidential. So thank you, Sarah, for that. Are there other topics that you'd like to address this morning? I didn't have any other topics on my list, and this might explain the whole, it's Monday morning and I'm only two coffees in. Um, but if there are questions out there in the field of verse that folks want to put out to me, I mean, a little Monday morning stump the attorney is always, you know, an important ritual. It goes sort of along with, yep, I really should have gone to bed an hour earlier last night. Um, I'm going to stop the recording if this is the end of the FOA part, and then we'll take the questions off, off the record so that won't be part of the training. Oh, excellent. That way, Stump the Attorney won't be.